happy. <clears throat> I, didn't, I, I posed this question last Sunday night. Anyone do Advent? Anybody familiar with Advent? Some people, few people light the candles. I remember, it's been years ago, when we were at Hall Baptist, we did a series on Advent one time. Long time back. But <clears throat> I never really thought much about it until I got to, to really read and pray and understand it. And I, I got to thinking about what that really means. And we're going to talk about that over the next few weeks. But <clears throat> we just thought Advent was just Christmas. We didn't really did. But, but Advent means arrival. And I think as you begin to see the 400 years of silence from God, they lived in the anticipation of the Advent, the arrival. In the 400 years between Malachi 4 6, when he in those last words there in the sixth verse of Malachi until Matthew stroked his pen in Matthew's Gospel chapter 1 verse 1 there was there was 400 years of silence. God had not spoken. It's like he had ghosted his people. And they waited in great anticipation for a Savior that was to come. They waited in great anticipation for what the prophets had, had said was going to come. Isaiah and Micah and where he was coming to and, and how he was going to come and and through the concept of, of Advent, they awaited this arrival. And I think as we begin to, to see this, we have to look at Christmas just a little bit differently. Because Christmas has gotten really out of, out of context. It's gotten really distorted over the years. We've allowed the commercialism and the, and the, the secular world to, to dictate what Christmas is like. And we traditionally look back and reunite ourselves with the stories and the characters of Christmas. We go back and we study Joseph and Mary and the baby and we study the wise men and the Magi and we study all of this and we reunite ourselves and for just a few weeks it makes us feel better. Yeah. But I think as we begin to look at this we've got to understand that there is another advent. There's another arrival and he's not coming back as a baby in a manger from Bethlehem. He's not coming back and being wrapped in swaddling clothes. But this next arrival, as we begin to understand from the Bible, it tells us that He's coming again. And He's one of these days when the trumpet of God shall sound. He's going to split those eastern skies. He's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And do this through these next few years, these years, however long it may be. We live in anticipation of that great coming again. Amen. And as we focus our heart and our mind on that, as we begin to think about that, it brings hope into our heart. So as we still, instead of looking back at Christmas, now we're going to look ahead. We're going to look for another arrival. We're going to look for another advent when Jesus returns. And therein is where our hope lies. Not in what happened. It's good to look back. Not in just the, the fact that he comes with a baby in a manger. It takes more than that. But I think as we see this, <coughs> that was our review from last week. Let's kind of move on. Let's, we find ourselves right smack dab in the middle of Christmas. If you don't believe it, you just go to the, go to the, to the stores. You'll find out that, hey, Christmas is upon us. You turn on the TV. Christmas is upon us. It's all around us. And over the next few weeks, this Christmas party's here and shopping there and hustle and bustle and busyness everywhere that we go. Here at church, you're going to hear the Christmas songs that I so much enjoy. And we heard some this morning and I look forward to some more. And come out on Wednesday night and we're going we're gonna to pick apart those songs and dissect those songs and understand those songs and really learn what those songs mean to us and how it applies to our life. So many times we sing those songs and we don't even have an understanding of what they are. We just sing them because they're there. But let's come out on Wednesday night and study the, the songs of Christmas. We'll, we'll pick a few and, and go through a little bit of time to go through a while. Love them by no stretch of imagination. But we did the first Noel last Wednesday, and, and I really enjoyed that. So uh, y'all come out and, and be a part of that on Wednesday night. But, you know, we study those songs and understand them, and, and it's just a great opportunity. And you're going to hear Scripture. You're going to hear Scripture like the one we read this morning. And as we begin to understand that, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now that's an amazing truth. That, that's just within itself. We could just preach that passage of Scripture. We could just probably part right there and go for probably the next hour, hour and a half, just off of that one particular Scripture. But we're not going to do that. I want to really bring some, some insight to this. And I, I think about <clears throat> what it says, Emmanuel. What that means. That means God with us. But really, let's look at that for just a moment. Does that line up with what we see in our world? 
is we begin to walk around our world, we begin to see the chaos, we begin to see the, the anxiety of the world, we begin to see the oppression and the racism and the depression and all of the things that are going on in our world. And, and we look and we look at our lives and we look at everything that's going around in life. Emmanuel, God with us? We ask the same brutally honest question that a man named Gideon asked many, many years ago in Judges chapter 6, verse 13. I'm going to ask our ministers of magnification and illumination back there. They do a fantastic job. He's going to put that, going to put that up there for us. And as we begin to see this, it said, Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this to follow us? Where be all the miracles which our fathers told us of? May he did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Amen. Now, as we begin to see this, Gideon is looking around at his world, and the angel of the Lord has spoken to him in the wine press on his fresh and wheat, and he said this, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, you, don't, you need to show me where, because I don't see it. I'm having a hard time seeing this. And I think if he looked at the depravity and dysfunction and the chaos of the world that he was living in, he looked at that angel and he said these words, Oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why is all this happening? And I think we, we, <clears throat> he drew the conclusion that God had abandoned them. And I think if we're not careful today, we'll draw that <laughs> same conclusion as we look at the chaos and the depravity, the heartache and the strife of this world. Yeah. And we'll look and we'll ask that question, God, where are you? Where are you in this hurt? But the truth is, the great truth of the Word of God is that, that, that Emmanuel is God with us. He is here. We may not see him. We may not sometimes even feel him. Thank God we come into church this morning. I feel the power and the presence of God. I hope you do too. But as we begin to see this and understand this, we begin to see that even though we don't hear him, even though he may not speak in, speak to us sometimes, there's times in our life that we just wonder, God, where are you at? He's still here. The only thing, the problem is that we have to do is awaken ourselves to his presence. We just have to wake up and say, okay, God, I want to clear my mind, I want to clear the clutter out of my mind, and I want to seek your face, and I want to seek your presence. And I think as we begin to understand that, we come into church a lot of times like that. Some people say, well, I didn't feel nothing, I didn't get nothing. And I think there's others that feel like, you know, oh yeah, I felt the presence of God. But sometimes if we don't awake ourselves to the presence of God, yes. we'll sleep through it. Yes, we will. We'll sleep right through it. And we'll leave. We'll change. We'll leave the same way. We'll leave as oppressed and depressed and as dysfunctional as we came in. But God says, no. You can have better because I'm here. Yes. I'm the light. I, and the light is here. The light is warm. And the light is for all that will receive it. Yes. And if we believe that and we trust that, then we can leave change. We can leave differently. We can leave with hope in our heart, joy in our spirit. And a song of praise on our lips. We can do that. And I think as we begin to <clears throat> really look at this, we need to awake ourselves not only to the presence of the Lord at Christmas time, as we study Emmanuel, but all year long. All year long we need to awake ourselves to His presence. Because Christmas literally <coughs> gets bigger and earlier every year. Christmas is as early now this year as it's ever been. Probably be earlier next year. I don't even know if we'll have Thanksgiving next year. We'll probably just start with Christmas right after Halloween. Who knows? But as we begin to think about this, this is early and it's as big as it's ever been. I'm talking about secular Christmas now. I'm talking about, you know, the sentiment and the nostalgia of Christmas and people putting up lights and, <coughs> and candy canes and, <coughs> and doing all the, the bows and the tinsel and all of that Christmas trees. That secular Christmas is getting bigger and earlier each year. And if all that, the whole, if all that is all we have to look forward to, listen to me. On December 26th, you'll find yourself depressed and sad. Because if that's all we've got to look forward to when all the Christmas trees come down and all the lights are turned off and all the, the glitter's gone and all the bows are taken down, we'll find ourselves hopeless and helpless again. If that's all we've got to look forward to. But if we look in the perspective of Advent, if we look into a, to a, a new coming, if we look into a new arrival, I, I think what we'll find is we'll find greater meaning, we'll find greater truth. Because here's the thing, Christmas entertains us. 
It really does. It entertains us. It keeps us moving at a at a hectic pace. It keeps us distracted with the lights and the tinsel and the parties and the and the press. It keeps the world numb with too much to eat and too much to drink. It does. It really just numbs us to the reality of Emmanuel and God being with us. Christmas creates the illusion of a perfect world. For the next few weeks, everything's good. We have something to look forward to. We have a we have a gathering, or we have an eating, or we have something to do over the next few weeks that keeps us entertained. And I think as we begin to see it, it kind of creates the nostalgia of a perfect world. And that's all gone on December 26th. But the <clears throat> Advent, Advent's different. It gives us something. Advent gives us something to use that we can flourish in the world as it is. Yes. In the world, it'll be here December 26th, 7th, 8th, 29th, 30th, right on through the remainder of the, this year and into the new year. And what we get from Christmas, traditional Christmas, Secular Christmas. If that's all we have, let's just be real. What do we get from secular Christmas, church? We get debt. We get family conflict. And we get about 10 extra payments. Think about it. That's about what we get from secular Christmas. From the nostalgia of real Christmas as we celebrate. But what we get from Advent, four things that we get from Advent, there's four, if you do the candles and you study the Advent, you study the, the, the thing and the meaning of the, and the theology of Advent, what you'll find is we get hope, we get peace, we get joy, and we get love. Yeah. Those four things from Advent, and these are the things that we need to live in the world and to thrive in the world. And last week we touched on it, we're going to touch on it just a little bit more, we're going to get into it, but we talk about hope. We talk about a hopeless world, how we how we put all the lights up to bring joy to a hopeless world. This week we're going to talk about peace. Now, all these words, they work in conjunction with each other. They're, you can't hardly have one without the other. But as we begin to put them all together, they're all connected. <clears throat> and let's just recap really, really quickly about hope. And then we're going to jump into peace. Hope is looking ahead. It's not looking back. And, and you know, there's a, a, a biblical hope that points us to a future. And I think sometimes we use this word very loosely. We use this word hope really, really loosely. And I think we all, we use it in an uncertain form sometimes because it's always our version of hope is uncertain. You think about how we use it. I hope I get a, you fill in the blank for Christmas. I hope I get a, a baby Yoda for Christmas. Or I hope I get a, a new bike for Christmas. Or I hope I get a new car for Christmas. Or I hope I get some new shoes for Christmas. Or I hope that I get this for Christmas. But does that mean you're going to get it? Not necessarily. You hope you do. But that don't necessarily mean. We use it in the political form. Our only hope of, 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 of getting America better is a change in leadership. We think about it like that. I mean, we, we use that. Is, that. is that going to happen? And if it does happen, is that going to fix the problem? Not necessarily. We use that hope like that. We also use it as a sense of false security. And, you know, I, I hope the treatment will work. I really hope it will. I hope I survive the next round of layoffs. I, I hope my, my children will get in church. It's a biblical hope. It's a hope of certainty, not uncertainty. See, we use that word loosely. We use that word so, so, so loosely. And there's a an assurance, a non-assurance that comes from that word the way we use it, but from a biblical standpoint, there is an assurance that comes from it, an assurance that we have hope of Jesus' return and the joy that it's going to bring one day. We have hope of that. Now, I think as you see and think about that, so how can we be so assured that he's coming again? Well, he said he was, right? I mean, John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 3. I didn't put that on your list. So don't, don't know how to put that up there. But it said this. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Let your heart not be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, what did he say? He said, I'm coming back to receive you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. He said, I'm coming again. Is that good enough? Is that just the word of God? Just, to, just Jesus saying that to his disciples many, many years ago? Is that good enough? Yes. It should be. Yes. It should be good enough that we'll say, yeah, he said it, I believe it. Well, I'm trusting him. I believe him. But how do we know that we can trust someone? How do we know that we can trust what's being said? 
How do we, ah, oh, let's start with people. How do we know that if someone says they're going to do something, how do we know that they're going to do it? Well, first time, if we've never even talked to this person, we're just going to have to take them at face value the first time. But if we've ever dealt with these people before, <clears throat> what do we do? We want to back historically in their life. Yes. And we say, okay, the last time he or she said that they was going to do this, did they do it? No. If they did or if they didn't. If they didn't do it, then we probably got our doubts that they're going to do it this time, right? But if they did, if, they, if, they, if we found them dependable, we'll look at them and we'll say, oh yeah, they did what they said they were going to do last time. And I hope and I trust in my heart that they'll do what they said they're going to do this time. Yeah. So we find hope in that. Now we begin to think about Jesus. Jesus has never lied. Jesus can't lie. And if we begin to understand it, we don't have to just look back historically and say, well, is Jesus going to come again just because he said he was going to come again? No, we take that historical view and we look back and we know that he's coming again because he came the first time. Amen. He came in a manger bed to him just like God said he would do it. And I think as we begin to understand this, we got to really wrap our minds around this. You know, think about Jesus coming. He didn't just come and die on the cross to not finish the story, church. Amen. He didn't go through what he went through. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But the Apostle Paul says it this way. And I want to read <coughs> off, off of the... Um, I'm hanging this thing. Let's get too far ahead of my <coughs> you, put, you put that up here. We'll get to it in just a minute. So let's look at how we know Jesus is coming again. We know that he's coming again because he said this. He said, I am... Coming back to take you, receive you where I am, you may be also. Now, he didn't do that just to walk away. He didn't do that just so he could say, oh, I changed my mind. I'm not coming. But we think of peace. Now, how, we have hope, and then we have that hope kind of fosters peace. Now, as we think about peace, what do we think about when we think about peace? We think about peace as being calm, tranquility. We think about all of these things. And as we begin to really ponder about calmness and tranquility, that, that's all good. When we want peace in our heart, we should just take away all the trouble, all the strife, all the heartache, all the anxiety, all the worry, all the fear. You take all that away, God, we'll live in a perfect world, right? That's what we want. We got to remove this. We say it in our prayer. We come and we, we, we burst forth to this altar and say, God, take this away. God, I don't want to have to deal with none of this stuff. I don't want to deal with fear. I don't want to deal with hurt. I don't want to deal with heartache. I don't want to deal with aggravating people. I don't want to deal with, you know, I don't want to deal with this. And we give God a, a, a laundry list of things we don't want to deal with. Amen. And as we begin to look at the world that we live in, how many times have we seen that, I, that we brought our laundry list to God and God just taken all that out of our life? Oh, we're still there. <clears throat> Y'all don't want to just <clears throat> teach us how to get away from this stuff. God wants to teach us how to thrive through this stuff. In the world of peace, He wants us to be able to have peace, the calmness and the tranquility of God, not of the world, in us, even though the world is in chaos around us. Yes. And He's going to teach us how to do this. So, as we see this, we begin to understand <coughs> that when He comes to suffer, He didn't come to just say, alright, I'm going to suffer for a little while, and that's it. But no, we get into this and we really begin to understand the peace of God. The Apostle Paul says this, but now follow up, guys. So we're going to look at it in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, and what the Apostle Paul says. And this is what he says to the church of Philippi. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, hold on to that word, I have learned in whatsoever state that I am, therewith to be content. He says, I know how to be both obeyed, and I know how to obey. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full, to be hungry, both to abound, and both to suffer need. Then he said the last thing there, he said that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now as we see this, this is what I love about the words of Paul. He writes these to the church at Philippi. He said this, the peace that we long for, it just don't come naturally to us, church. Amen. Peace is just not so. We are worried. We are anxious about everything. We have we can have this building that we're going to worry about something. We just don't have this perfect peace just built into it. So how do we get this? The Apostle Paul says it this way. He said, I want you to understand I've learned this. That's what he said. He said, I have learned. Verse 11, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, I'm in, therewith to be content. <clears throat> now, here, here's the thing. He learned what? He learned this tranquility. He learned this calmness. He learned
earned his poise that he operated in. Now, how do we cultivate peace in our life if it's not natural to us? Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. We're going to put that up there and go back and look just immediately to see that what the apostle said, Paul said. He said, be careful for nothing, but in everything. You know, if you go back and read that in a, in a different text, you'll find out it says, don't worry, don't be anxious for nothing. But in everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. It goes on. And it says, in the peace of God, hold on there, the peace of God, which passes all understanding to keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then it says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And he says, those things which you have both learned, there's that word again, and received and heard, seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Amen. Now think about this for just a moment. What is the Apostle Paul saying right there? He's just beginning to just give them a whole bunch of theology right there. He's beginning to pour out some things, and there's a couple things we need to get connected with right here. Two ways to be connected to God. And I think verse 6 gives us one of them. And it says this. <clears throat> it says, be careful for nothing, but in everything, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So we pray and we ask God and we seek God, but we seek Him with thanksgiving. Now that's kind of out of order right there for just a little bit. If we read this, we don't pray that way. We don't do that with thanksgiving. We give thanks after God answers the prayer. That's how we, that's how we work as Christians. Oh yeah, there's a few times we're going to come up here and say, well God, I'm going to go ahead and thank you in advance. I prayed that way before. But sometimes God don't answer our prayer the way we expect Him to. Sometimes God don't answer our prayer at all anywhere like we expect Him to or even the way we ask Him to. So if we're going to thank Him in advance and He don't answer our prayer, then what have we done? We just asked Him for something that didn't happen. So as we think about this, he said, don't you pray and be thankful first. <clears throat> and I think about this. I think about the disciples standing in the, from a distance, looking up at the cross, looking up at, at their beloved friend, hanging between the heavens and the earth. I believe in my heart of hearts that they were probably standing in a distance. I believe that his mother Mary was probably on her knees in the ground, looking up at her blessed son and saying prayers like this. God sent a miracle. God, he's almost dead. Get him off of that cross. Please, God, do something. God, if we've ever needed a miracle, God, help us. God, please help us. I mean, you just give the, you give the, the gist of their prayer there. You can only imagine what they were praying. And they're probably thinking, okay, God, we're looking at this. We're seeing this, God. You're going to let him die on that cross. God, nothing good can come from this. I mean, you think about that before the, the cross. You think about what they're thinking. They don't know the rest of the story. They don't have their Bible to read what happened afterwards. They don't know that on that first Easter morning he's going he's gonna to rise from the dead. They've been told that, but they're just not wrapping their minds around it. And here they are. They're looking at this, praying for a miracle, and they're thinking nothing good can come from this chaos. Amen. And sometimes God don't answer. Don't answer our prayers like we, like we ask Him to. But the fact of the matter, they were thinking nothing good could come from this chaos. But the good news of the gospel and the truth of the gospel is the greatest good in the world came from this chaos. Yes, the greatest thing that could ever happen to the mankind in the, in the world as a whole came from this chaos. So we pray with thanksgiving that God is sovereign. He's in control. He's answered our prayers not according to our will, but according to His will. And His will perfects good in our lives. And as we begin to understand that, we thank Him. And then in verse 8 and 9, we kind of let these things roll through our minds. There you go. It says, finally, brethren. He said, whatsoever things are, are, are honest, and whatsoever things are just, and whatsoever things are pure, and lovely, and, and good report, and if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. And then it says, those things which you have learned and received and heard, seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And he, what is he doing there? Paul gives them all of this stuff. And he begins to give them this, these words. And what, what is those words? If we really look at that, that's just biblical doctrine that he 
information that we need. And I think as we begin to see this, he's given them doctrine that they're going to take this information. Now, what are they supposed to do with this information? They're supposed to take this information, and it's, it's used to inform us if we use it from a, from a doctrinal perspective. But I think the Apostle Paul is wanting to do so much more. It's the truth of God's Word. Yes. It is the doctrine of God's Word. It's the good theology. Yes. But as we begin to see this, the Apostle Paul is using it to encourage the church at Philippi. And here we are, 2,000 years later, we're, we're going through these same words, and he wants it to encourage us. Think on these things, he said. And this is the opposite. If you think about this, when he, he says think on these things, this is the opposite of what the world tells us to do. Yes. The world tells us to think on these things. When we stress, when we have anxiety, when we have heartache, when we have trouble, and his, his is like a, a freight train, like a wrecking ball. The Lord says, oh, it'll be all right. You go to a counselor, a therapist, whoever, they just want to just try some deep breathing. Just need to adjust your mindset just a little bit. Maybe meditate a little bit. Maybe change your lifestyle a little bit. We ask all of these people, all of these questions about all the books and the self-help books. And, and I think as you really begin to see... All of the, the common thread that runs through all of this is they're just telling you to disconnect from your problems, disconnect from everything, and it's going to be all right. Disconnect from reality, and it'll all be all right. That's like, okay. I tell you what, <clears throat> I'm going to, I got all these problems, and I'm going to take me a week's vacation, and when I come back, all these problems are going to be gone. Or I'll take you back a little further than that. Some of y'all make it connect with me. Back years ago, when, <clears throat> when I used to dabble in alcohol, sometimes I thought I'd drown my problems, y'all. Anybody ever tried that? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Did you ever thought about that? Say, well, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to drown all my problems. Yes. You know what you wake up with? A hangover and the same problems. That's what you wake up with. And I think this is the world's solution. To all the problems of the world. Just disconnect from them, drown them out, walk away from them, and everything will be good. You'll come back to them, you'll wake up the next morning, and everything will be good, Billy. Really. Wrong. That ain't the way it works. And I think as we see that, <coughs> we begin to see that this is what the Apostle Paul was beginning to share. Not to run from our problem, but to think on our problem. Amen. Meditate on the problems that we have, and meditate on our heartaches, our anxiety, our fear, our trouble, our strife. Don't 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 run from the hard questions. Don't run from the real issues of life. Don't ignore reality. This, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Apostle Paul teaches. He said, "No, don't do that. Think about it. Think about who God is. Think about what God has done. Think about what God is doing right now. Think about what God will do." And as we go back over this method over and over and over and over, over again in our mind, he said, "Think on these things." Over and over. What are we doing? <clears throat> We're preaching the gospel to ourselves over and over and over and over in our yeah. mind. Yeah. We're reminding ourselves that God came in the flesh. Yeah. We're reminding ourselves that He was a humble baby in a manger. We're reminding ourselves that He lived for 33 and a half years here in this world. We're reminding ourselves of the miracles and the goodness and the, and the parables and the teaching that He gave us during that lifespan that He lived here. But we're also that he humbled himself to death and he died the death that we should have died. He humbled the cross between the heavens and the earth and he was a redemption for our sin. And he humbled himself to death and as they took his body down and placed it in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, he, he humbled himself to death but on that third day, on that first Easter morning, he arose victoriously over death and the grave. And he arose over there. Forty days later, he ascended back to the Father and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father 
see what he has done. I know what he is doing. I've got the promise of God's word to know what he is going to do. And as we begin to really ponder upon that, it's not just good theology, it's truth of God's word, but it's encouragement to us as Christians to be able to do that. And when he comes again, he's going to set the world right. He's going to make it right. And we need to reset ourselves with this theology. And we need to believe. Advent gives us that real, real peace. From that real hope, we learn, as the Apostle Paul said, I hope. Learn. We have real hope and we learn to have real peace. Yes. We all want the peace of God. We want that. We desire that. But the peace of God is only available when we have peace with God. When we have real peace with God, how do we get peace with God? How do we obtain that? What does that look like in our life? I think the prophet Isaiah said it best as he gives us these words in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. He said, He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was upon him, and with his stripes, this is what it looks like. This is what true peace of God looks like. Real peace comes when we look at Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us. And I think as we begin to understand that, we begin to think, you know, I've been trying, I'm going to eventually, I'm going to fix myself. I'm going to get myself in. I'm going to get my life in check. Think about this. Christianity is the only religion that tells us that we can't fix ourselves. Amen. You go if you study any other religion you want to, and it's all some <clears throat> a group of steps, a group of process, of things that you have to do. <coughs> and if you do these, and if you cross all the dot all the I's and cross all the T's, then maybe you can live a fulfilled life. The rich young woman that came to Jesus, that's what he was looking for. <clears throat> Judaism was not satisfying the peace that he was looking for in his life. And he looked at Jesus and he said, Sir, what else do I need to do? And Jesus told him what to do. I'm like, I've done all that. I've kept the law. I've got it. I'm a steward of the law. I'm a steward of the law. I have got this. I've done it. And as we begin to see this, he just said, go sell what you have. Give it to the poor. Follow after me. And as we begin to understand this, we begin to see that the world tells us, if we want to look from a worldly perspective, we'll have to find peace in our heart. You go through these programs, and you do all these things, and you meditate, meditate, and you get on an exercise regimen, and you change your eating habits, and you change this, and you change your thought process, and you begin to do all this, and you escape from reality, reality every now and then, and you do whatever you want to do, and it's all going to be good. One day, if you do that enough, and if you keep practicing that in your life, you'll find the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That is not the truth of, the God, of God's Word, church. Because here's the thing. Christianity teaches us this. That it's not what we can do. Because <clears throat> this is what scares me about that. If that would work in your life. If that would work in my life. If I could connect enough dots. And dot enough eyes. And cross enough T's. How would I know when I've done enough? Amen. I'd hate to know that I stood before God. And God would tell me. You like one eye or one teeth or one dog. Yeah. That would be a dreadful day. But when I stand before God, He's not looking at teeth and eyes and dogs. He's looking at the blood and the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's why He said, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace. Our peace, it was upon Him. And by His stripes, we are healed. Yeah. And as we begin to look at that, our peace don't come from us. It came when he humbled himself to death. And he was wounded and bruised for our iniquities and transgressions. And as he was done, he did that. He supplied it all right there on the cross at Calvary. He canceled out my sin debt. He canceled out your sin debt. He forgave us. And he gave us a new life in Christ Jesus. Yeah. We will receive yeah. what he gave for us. If yeah. we will receive it in our heart. If we will do that, he did it for us. And he transferred the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Standing from him to us. It's not our peace, my peace, or your peace. It's the peace of God. What does it say? Our peace was upon him. <coughs> and he gave us the peace of God. Yes. This surpasses all understanding. Got a question. We've heard this. We know this. We understand this. 
who just know it and understand it and hear it just not enough. We've got to apply this to our life, church. We can read God's Word, we can study God's Word, we can know it from the front to the back. But if we don't apply it, if we don't let it become applicable in our life, if we don't let God be God, if we don't receive what He's given us, what He did for us, then we'll stand before God and just say, Depart from me, you work with me. I never knew you. No one wants to hear those words in church. God don't even want to say those words, but, but, he, but, but he has to because the choice is ours. He didn't make us a robot. We're a free moral agent. We make, make our own choices and choose our own way. We can choose our own way. But is it the right way? We have to choose God's way. And I just need to ask you this question. What's your next step? What's your next step in your Christian faith? What's your next step in your Christian walk? For some of you, your next step is your first step. The next step is placing your belief and your faith in Christ Jesus and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need to save you. Amen. God, I realize that my life is jacked up and messed up and tore up from the floor up. But God, I believe in the sacrifice of what you did on your son Jesus did on the cross. I believe there is redemption. I believe there's ransom. I believe there's pardon. I believe there's forgiveness. I believe, God, if I trust you and I confess my sins to you, I believe if I confess I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, you're sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting to make intercession and you'll forgive me. You'll write my name in the name of life. And you'll give me hope. You'll give me peace. You'll give me joy. You'll give me love. And I'll thrive in this world. The world may fall apart around me, but my, my heart will be full. Yes. Because I know that my joy is not sustained by the things of this world. My peace is not from what I can get from the number one bestseller. My joy don't come from the things that the world can offer me. And when Christmas is gone, everybody else may be sad. But God, I'm going to have peace and I'm going to have joy and I'm going to have love. Amen. I'm going to have it in my heart. And as we begin to look at that, maybe that's your next step. The first step. But maybe you've already done that. <laughs> maybe your next step is a deeper relationship with Jesus, a deeper fellowship with Him, seeking Him, studying His Word, letting the Word of God become applicable for your life. I don't know. I just ask today that you'll take that step. For some of you, it's taking a step in faith. It's taking a step out of the pew and coming to say, God, I need to say that. I'm a sinner. I need to say, I'm just taking a step and saying, God, I want to do more for you. God, I need to know you like I've never known you before. God, I know you in the free part of forgiveness of sin. But God, there's so much more that I want to know about you. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to meet with you on a daily basis. And I want to love you and you love me. And we have that kind of relationship. I don't know where you're at. But let's pray and ask God to meet you as you're born in me today. Father God, we thank you we might be able to come before your throne tonight. God, if many hearts are in this room this morning, I don't know. I couldn't begin to acquaint you with the needs. <clears throat> but God, whether it's one, two, ten, fifteen, or twenty, I don't know. They've never given their life to you. God, I pray you to touch that heart this morning. Give them courage and boldness to step out of faith and meet you as Lord and Savior. But God, for the rest of us, God, help us to have a deeper walk with you. God, help us to step into the truth of God's Word. Help us to walk in the fellowship that's intended for us. And God, I pray that you'll minister to us between you, your will, your purpose, and your desire in our life. And God, for, for those of us that need to take a step, God, show us the next step. And help us to trust you with our lives. God, as we, <clears throat> as we look at Christmas, don't let us be entertained. God, don't let us be entertained by nostalgia and the secularism of this world, the materialism of this world. God, let us be moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us be moved by the truth of your word, the doctrine and theology of your word. God, help us to be moved by those things. And God, think on these things. Think on the things that you say to think on. And God, and not ignore the hard problem, but God, dig into them with Jesus by our side. And knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that he works all things to get all things together for those who love him and he loves you. God, we thank you for that. 
We ask all these blessings and faith in Jesus' precious and holy name to be prayed. And all God's people say it. Amen. Amen.